this is a very broad overview of the area of ethical hacking and security testing. If you are on the um, security and forensics degree, you will be doing a lot more of this and um, basically you'll be doing uh, an entire module next semester which is this in a lot of depth and detail and you'll understand all of this stuff uh, in, a, in a great great deal of detail um, you know in one semester's time. Uh, but this is just like a taste test of, you know, the importance of ethical hacking and, and an overview of it. Um, obviously, you can apply these things in non-ethical ways because ethical hacking is basically... Well, does any, someone want to tell me what's ethical hacking? Penetration testing. Really. Yeah, penetration testing, which is what? Being paid to test a company security. Yes, being paid to test a company security. And essentially, it's just doing the same thing that malicious hackers do, except that you've got permission, basically. So it's legal hacking. Um, and it's not an oxymoron because the word hacker does not mean someone that's doing something illegal, even though maybe that's what how some people use the term. Um, so yeah, it's ethical hacking. So it is a legal attempt to compromise the security of a system, and it's often as a part of the process of doing security testing. So you are auditing the security of a company's computers, and a part of that will be you know, someone trying to break in to see whether or not it's possible. Uh, and so they'll do all the same methods and actions of malicious attackers, but without causing harm or with permission to cause harm. So you would have a very clear scope of what you're going to be doing and you're, for example, you might break into a company's computers. You're not then going to, um, you know, give yourself transfer money into your own account or, um, you know, wipe all of their servers or something like that because you're being paid to to tell them about the problems that you found so that they can fix it. Um, so you're paid to perform penetration tests, as you correctly said, um, and audits the security systems. So you're trying to determine what an attacker could do if they were in your shoes and maybe didn't have the best of intentions. But you are acting with explicit permission um, from the organization that you're attacking. Or all of the um, things that you're doing are legal, basically. So if you've got um, your own computer that you've got some software on, uh, it is basically perfectly legal for you to try and figure out how you can break that software. If you start attacking someone's server, then you're in a much grayer area and at risk of prosecution, basically, unless you've got permission from them to be doing that. And there are some companies that say that you can look for security problems as long as you do it um, ethically and you use responsible disclosure and stuff and you give them a chance to fix it before you go public and all that sort of stuff. Um, but Basically, you just need to make sure that you're definitely acting with permission to do what you're doing. So a security audit, there's a few different types. There's basically security testing um, that's completely, entirely theoretical analysis. So if you've got some diagrams of the company's computers, you might be able to see if you can figure out, like in theory, how, you know, any gaps in the security that they've got. Um, all the way to like a hands-on intrusion attempt where it's your job to actually, like penetration testing is where you go as deep as you can basically. Like you are given permission to hack into the computer and once you hack into one computer, you might actually also then try and hack into another computer. So you hack into their web server and then you scan their internal network and say, oh, I can, there's another computer I can attack, you hack into that computer and then you look around and you hack into another computer and, and you, you know, you see what's possible within their network and you would then report on that. Um, but the type of testing will really depend on the aims of the organization, who you're being hired you know, by. So if they you know, really want to make sure that they are secure, then they might be quite keen to basically allow you to try all kinds of different things. Um, otherwise, they, they might not be as concerned or they just want to, you know, depending on their own goals, they might think it's enough just to focus on perimeter defenses, for example, and just like want you to test specific servers, and then that would be what you would do as part of your testing. So it depends on how 
thorough they want the test to be. And also compliance and legal requirements. So uh, a lot of the security industry is driven by this need for, to be, for businesses to be compliant with various um, standards and things. So for example, um, PCI DSS, which is Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, is a very common um, type of test that a lot of companies need to do. So if, for example, you process more than um, a certain number of credit cards, um, then you are required by Visa and MasterCard to be compliant with PCI DSS. Um, <clears throat> DSS and what that means is that will involve some ethical hacking. So you will hire someone to test your compliance basically. So that does basically keep a lot of um, the security industry with plenty of work to do because it's all the, yeah. If there was a company that had to abide by the data protection act, would they mm -hmm. test the as well? So everyone needs to comply with the data protection act in the UK. Um, the most relevant from a security perspective is principle seven, seven or eight, seven, which says that uh, you must use uh, appropriate security, security mechanisms to protect private data. Um, so in theory, anyone, any business that uh, actually holds the um, personal information is required to have appropriate security in place. Uh, exactly what that means in terms of uh, ethical hacking and pen testing is like a little bit vague because what is appropriate um, but there are, is certainly um, a legal requirement to have security in place and that would drive some companies to hire you know pay for security audits there are other kinds of standards like ISO standards and various other types of compliance that um, involve ethical hacking so there's plenty of, of those sorts of things but my point is that will specify the kinds of tests that need to be done. Um, so if that if they were just going for compliance, they might not be that keen on like a full pen test, but they would tell you that you need to focus on these areas because that's what's important for their compliance. So, or you, as a security auditor, you would know or you know the sorts of things that you need to test for in order to um, say whether or not they're compliant. So all ways you would start by signing contracts and stuff that gives you explicit legal protections or letter of authority. Because the last thing you want is for them to turn around and sue you at the end. So you know you need to make sure it's very clear that something could go wrong. I'm going to be trying to break into your servers. There is a chance that that will cause your server to crash. They need to be aware of that and sign off and say you know yes we accept that possibility and so that they don't then just turn around and sue you for everything that you've got. Um, because of during your test, you you know made a mistake and caused them to lose information. Uh, so um, also, you know you you need to you know what I was just talking about limitation of liability. So so saying if something goes wrong, who's responsible for it? And often you would sign an NDA, non disclosure agreement, so that um, basically you agree that you're not going to go public with anything that you find because you're being hired by them to, to test it and then you tell them and then they've, they've got a chance to do what they will with that information. Um, so if you are going into this, you need to know what the scope is. So what are you allowed to attack and what aren't you allowed to attack? How, what's the depth? You know, are you just doing a high level policy audit or you're actually doing a penetration test? When are you going to be doing it? So sometimes they'll want you to do it in off-peak times. So for example, if, you are, if you're likely to crash a server, they'd rather that happen when is not their peak business time. Um, and also, you'll want to know whether or not the IT staff of the company that you're trying to hack into, whether they know that it's happening, because that will also change what you do. So um, sometimes they will be informed that, that something's happening and then therefore they will be in a heightened state of alert. So they'll be looking at things to try and figure out what's happening. Other times they don't get informed, you know, because they're trying to test whether or not the IT department will actually pick up the fact that this is happening. Um, and then, you know, you want to be, basically keep yourself under the radar. And there are various like evasion things that you can do to stop 
yourself from being detected. So like things like IDSs, like flagging up the fact that you're being attacked and things like that. So the tester's knowledge can either be white box, black box, or gray box. So white box is when the tester has access to basically all the information. So in a white box security audit, you might be given all the policy documentation, network diagrams, information about the software that's running on each of the computers, uh, and you just like have access to everything. You might be able to interview people at the, you know, there to find it, ask them questions about security. Um, basically, you get access to everything, and then that allows you to be quite thorough and look for problems. But maybe that's not realistic in terms of what an external hacker would have access to. And therefore, it depends, again, what they're trying to find out. Um, you can go all the way to the other end of the spectrum, which is the flat box, where the tester doesn't get given anything. Maybe you've just got an IP address or an IP address range. And that's all you start off with, So, or even a domain name. You're allowed to attack our servers. That's all you know. And we will, um, you know, that's it. You know, go for it. See what you can figure out and how to do it. Um, and in that case, you're basically put into the same position as an external hacker would be in. So you need to start off by finding out all the details about the servers. You want to find out like what the IP addresses are and what's running on those machines, um, and you know all of those steps that a normal um, you know external attacker would take. And in most cases, it's like a grey box where it's somewhere in between. So you're given some information, but quite limited. So you might go here, here you go, you can have a network diagram and IP address range, and that's all we're going to give you, uh, for example. So the other side of things is what the IT department knows. So the people that's working for the organization that are being tested, um, they might not be told. So the, the management might want to test you know, what the capabilities are of their own team. Um, there's like tandem tests, which is where basically everyone's well informed and know that it's happening. There's reversal white box, which is where the, the attackers have information about the organization, but the IT department basically knows nothing that's happening. Blind black box is where the IT know what's happening, but the attackers have no special advanced knowledge, and double blind is where basically everyone's in the dark. So that's where You've got the, the IT department don't know what's happening and the um, security auditors aren't given any extra, any special information, but given permission to try and break in and see what they find, which is one of the most interesting uh, type of tests to be involved in because you need to figure out what's happening and at the same time, the people that you're hacking into don't know that you're doing it. So there's a few things you can, um, like channels that you can use to try and attack uh, an organization. Um, so you can use the human side of things, so social engineering. So I can call someone that works for the organization and pretend to be someone else to try and get extra information or hopefully trick someone into giving me access to something that I shouldn't have access to. Um, so there's all sorts of things that you can do with social engineering and we'll talk about that later in the semester. We also have some guest lectures lined up um, this semester who will be talking about social engineering. Um, there's the physical security side of things. So if you're doing a penetration test, sometimes your scope will include breaking into the building. So you might um, actually just dress up as a janitor or whatever and just you know tailgate your way into the building uh, and then just kind of walk into the CEO's office and sit down at the chair and plug in and try and log into their laptop. Um, you might be doing lock picking even, depending on the scope, obviously, it needs to be very clearly defined in your contract what you're going to be testing, but it might involve trying to actually, you know, physically break into, pass some locks into the building. And then there's the network security, which is what we all think about when we're thinking of, of um, ethical hacking, which is where we go in by the internet or a Wi-Fi connection, or, you know, maybe once we've got physical access, we can plug into a switch or a router, and then we can start communicating with the computers inside their network even though we might not be able to get to it from the internet, for example. So there are all these different ways that we can try and interact with their computers to try and figure out if we can get extra access to them. So there's all these different ways that you can test things, um, but however you're doing it, it is really important that you are being as thorough as possible. Um, but one of the problems with all these things is you can't really compare the results from different types of tests 
And even if you have two different companies that you hire to do the exact type, same type of test, you might get two completely different sets of results depending on all the different techniques that they're attempting. Um, unfortunately, you'd hope that that wasn't the case, but unfortunately it is. So um, it, it's important as much as possible for them to be as thorough as possible. Um, so penetration testing, as I've already said, is basically when you're doing hands-on intrusion attempts. So it's not just theoretical, but you're actually breaking in and you're usually going for depth so that you don't stop after one um, computer. You would basically keep trying to see how much access you can gain. Um, and when you're doing that, you really do want to log all of the activities, everything that you're doing, so that later on, if someone does turn around and say you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing, it's like, well, I've got a log file. This shows everything I did, and it's all within scope. Um, and um, obviously, always act within the scope. Um, so we're only attacking the assets that you've got permission to attack and within the time frame that you're given. Uh, if you're told that you've got seven days to do the attack and you forget to do one kind of test, you can't then just go, oh, the seven days are up, but I'm just going to do that last part of the test. You need to contact them again and get that permission to do that because, you know, otherwise you're acting illegally because you're acting outside the scope of your contract. It's really important to avoid, you know, ending up... Uh, in uh, legal problems. So um, the output of a security audit is almost always a report. So you are going to report on what you've actually found. So you would report on what kinds of problems you investigated and what you found. Um, you might have prioritized it for them. So like these are critical vulnerabilities that you really want to sort out as soon as possible. You might have some recommendations, so mitigation strategies. So I found this problem, you might really want to think about updating the software because you should not be using this out-of-date software. It has software vulnerabilities. Your firewall rules should probably not even allow access to these ports and things like that. So that would be the sorts of things that you would report to them. And in order to be as systematic as possible, most penetration testers will follow a methodology. So Basically, a security testing methodology is like a standard way of testing something. So it'll basically lay out all the kinds of tests you should do. And there's all these different methodologies. Some will go as far as telling you what tools to use. Others will just tell you, remember to check for physical security. So you sometimes it's kind of like a reminder checklist of all the sorts of things that you should be testing for. And also different methodologies might include reporting templates and things that you can use to write your report with. Um, so an example of formal methodology is open source security testing methodology manual, OSSTMM or AUSTM or whatever you want to call it. Um, in practice, different security companies actually really differ in their methods. And a lot of them won't follow a formal methodology to the T and they'll have their own in-house testing methodology. But it is important to be aware of those things. So how does an attack work? Typically, uh, the steps taken by an attacker will be the same whether you're malicious or you have permission. And this basically starts with information gathering, exploitation, and then post-exploitation. So the information gathering stage is where you're collecting information about the company. So finding things like IP addresses and whether what what programs and services and things are there that you can try and attack. Exploitation is where you actually do something that gives you access and post-exploitation is the stuff that you do once you've got access to a computer that you've hacked into. So like maintaining your access, so adding adding an extra user account so that you can get back in, covering your tracks you know, to demonstrate that you can do that um, would be the sorts of things that you would do. So I'm going to talk about each of those steps in a little bit more detail now. So reconnaissance um, is also known as footprinting. It's where you collect information about the organization. You're trying to find out as much as possible. There's non-invasive techniques you can use that don't require any special um, authority. So you can do things that are completely passive that the company that you're attacking will basically never detect. So for example, by reading job advertisements. So if you read a job advertisement for a company, they'll often include mention of the software they use because they're looking to hire someone that have, has experience with that software. If you know what software they use, then you know what kinds of attacks you'll be thinking about using against that company. Um, just doing Google searches and reading other websites around the internet might include all sorts of information about that company. Um, so it can either be 
um, passive where you basically you don't interact with their, their systems or active where you actually do interact with their computer systems. So the sorts of uh, reconnaissance thing, yeah, sneaky like a ninja. Uh, so the kinds of reconnaissance things you can do is like DNS lookups to find IP addresses. You can use who, who is, which will give you information about who registered the domain. You can use job advertisements, so like I just mentioned. You can use trace route. Uh, which will tell you basically all of the steps between you and the attacker. So are there, you know, how many routers are they between you and them? Um, you can do dumpster diving, which is what it sounds like. You look through their rubbish because they might have printouts of things that can include sensitive information, which you can use against them in your attacks. Uh, you can use social engineering, which is where you talk to someone and try and trick them into revealing extra information. And then once you've got that initial information, you would go onto a scanning phase where you actually build on that knowledge that you already found by footprinting. So you start actively querying their servers. So you want to enumerate as much as possible all the details that you can get out of their servers. And you want to try and identify any possible vulnerabilities. What are the weaknesses in their computer systems? So at this stage, we want to, our main aim is to identify what platforms they're using, like what software do they have, what services, you know, what if they've got port 80 open, then you know there's probably a web server there. If you start talking to that web server, what you know what is on that website? Is there like an API there that you can talk to? You know what is the basically all the ways that they're um, the attack surface that you have? What are all the ways that they're exposed to you? All the different things that you can start to try and interact with to try and break their systems. <coughs> you want to see if you can figure out any user account names. So, for example, if you um, if we take Leeds Becker as an example, there is like a standard number, like username scheme used for staff members. If you know someone's surname, you can probably figure out their username. Uh, so things like that might come in handy. If you know their name, you can figure out their email address um, because it's just like in first initial dot surname at Leeds Becker, for example. Yeah. You can use all of that knowledge as well to help with social engineering. Yes. If yeah. you pretend that you know something about a business, it makes you look like you're a part of a business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And email is not a secure um, communication. Um, so you can send an email that looks like it came from anyone else. So I could send an email that had a had a um, address as Emlon, for example, even though he didn't send that email, I can just set that to be the um, the address that it comes from, and then I can put the reply to address being some maybe like Emlyn. So I can make it look like it's going from Emlyn at Leeds Beckett, and then have the return address as Emlyn dot uh, Butterfield uh, at Gmail or whatever. And actually, that's an account that I've created. So you can do all sorts of things to try and trick people. Um, so so yeah, you want to find out as much as possible at this stage. You really want to understand the attack surface as much as you can so that you can ready yourself for an actual attempted attack. So you can use things like port scanners to find open ports and services that are running, and you can use vulnerability scanners to try and identify known security issues with the software that's there. So things like Nessus can automatically pick up um, security problems and detect that this, this server is probably vulnerable <laughs> to this kind of attack. <coughs> so at this stage, we might do things like ping sweeps, which is where we basically try and ping all the IP addresses and see whether any of them reply. Uh, you can do war dialing, which is basically where you, you automate trying to call phone numbers. So obviously that was more relevant in the 80s than it is now, but you used to have like dial-up modems. So you could try calling all of the phone numbers. So say for example, we know Leeds Beckett, the phone number always starts with the first certain number of digits, and there's the digits at the end, which is the thing that changes. So if you're doing a scan against Lee Beckett, you could use a war dialer to dial them all, and software will basically call the number, and if it replies back with a screeching modem, then you know you've found a computer that you can start trying to talk to. Now, obviously, that's less relevant nowadays, but if you're trying to be super thorough, you might still do a war dialing attempt, especially if you're talking about a really old organization that's been around a really long time. There might still be some modems hooked up, like some old, old school analog modems, like connected in. Um, and uh, but you know, probably it's less relevant, and people won't bother with that very often anymore. Yeah. 
Um, a fax machine is a similar thing, yeah. So, like, traditionally a modem was, yeah, I don't know if I need to explain it. It's, it's a device that you connect your computer to the phone line, and then when you dial a, a modem that's listening, it basically translates the signal that's analog over the phone line to a digital message so it can talk to the computer on the, on the other side. But yeah, fax, I think, is a similar technology. Um, so you do port scanning, network scanning, banner grabbing, which is where you just connect to a port and start talking to it and see what it responds with. And that might tell you something about the software that's there. Enumeration, which is where you um, start talking, making queries to those servers to find out as much as you can. <coughs> and at that stage, you can try and acquire access. So this is where we actually do the attack. Usually what that involves is we've actually done the hard work already during the information gathering and we've identified that this computer will be vulnerable to this type of attack. So then we basically launch an attack using some prepackaged, often like a prepackaged exploit that someone else has written um, that will exploit that vulnerability that we've identified and that will give us access to that computer. Um, so I think it's worth mentioning at this point Next, next year, we'll go into this in a lot more detail, or if you're on the computing degree, you can do an optional module in your final year, which will go into this in a lot more detail and actually do a lot of this ethical hacking stuff. Um, and in your final year, if you're on the forensics and security module uh, degree, then you'll be doing things like detecting your own, find, how, to, how to actually ident identify your own vulnerabilities, how do you find new problems, and how do you write um, the exploits to actually attack these problems. So, so this is all stuff to come in your degree. At this stage, it's just an overview. So the attacks um, will generally either target a design problem. So say, for example, someone's written some software and they forget to check each time it receives a command whether or not the user is allowed to do that thing. That would be a, a logic mistake. So they've made some kind of like design decision that was wrong. Or maybe an implementation mistake, which is like a programming mistake. Often, like a one-line, like programming mistake, can cause huge security ramifications. So, um, if you guys are going on to do any any kind of programming, whether or not you stay in the security industry or not, it's really important to understand that it only takes a small little programming mistake that can cause someone to be able to take control of that program. So if we're talking about something like C programming language, it'll be a one-line mistake which causes a buffer overflow. If we're talking about website design, you might have a, a one-line mistake that accidentally allows SQL injection, uh, which allows us to access your database and things like that. Um, so the sorts of things we might do at this stage are like password cracking, buffer overflows, command injection, social engineering. So we do whatever it takes to get access to their computer. Once we've got access, we might want to make sure we can get in again. Again, this is something that maybe if you're doing ethical hacking, you might not do depending on the scope. But if you're a malicious attacker, you might want to make sure you can get back into that computer. So that might involve basically trying to sniff passwords off the network. So you've got access to their internal network now. If they've got an insecure you know, FTP server or something, you might see the password on the network. Um, or alternatively, you might install a key lo keylogger, which will basically show you everything being typed onto the computer that you've hacked into. And if they, if they log into something, you'll now have know what their password is. Or you might crack hashed passwords, which is something that you do in the lab, I believe. Um, you might install root kits or Trojan horses. So that's like malware that um, like a root kit hides presence from an operating system. Uh, and a, a Trojan horse is software that does so something malicious that you don't expect it to do. Basically, you can install some software that will give you access to that computer later. Or the simplest version, I just create a new a user account on that computer and give it a username that probably no one will suspect. So um, you know, if you've got someone called Tony in the organization and you create an account that's Tony1 and there's already a Tony there, chances are if they're not taking really close attention to it, they might not notice there's another account there when they've got access. You can change the capitals. For yeah, or capitalization if you're on a Unix system. Yeah. Um, so you can, yeah, subtle ways, things that someone might not notice if they're not paying really close attention. 
you can use monitoring tools to pick this sort of stuff up. But again, it's something a lot of companies don't do. Covering your tracks. So then you might try and hide evidence that you've even been there. So you might be deleting log files or log entries. You might hide your own tools using like root kits. Steganography, which is where you can hide data within other data. So for example, you might hide your tools within some, some photo or whatever so that you can easily get it later. Um, you might um, use other ways of hiding data like um, alternative data streams in Windows, which is a really weird thing where you can basically have a file that has two different sets of content and you can access it. it it's something that almost no one knows about, but on Windows you can, you can have a file that has, you open it and you see one thing. But if you type the file name and then a colon and something else, you can get at this alternate version of the file so you can hide your tools within existing tools. Um, so yeah, just weird things like that where you can just hide your, your things in various ways. But basically the takeaway message is that in order to do security, it really helps to think like an attacker. So this is a quote from Bruce Schneier. Security requires a particular mindset. Security professionals, at least a good one, see the world differently. They can't walk into a store without noticing how they might shoplift. They can't use a computer without wondering about the security vulnerabilities. They can't vote without trying to figure out how to vote twice. They just can't help it. So in this week's lab, or next week's lab, I should say, you'll be doing ethical hacking and you'll go through each of those stages of attack. And it will step you through these things. Keeping in mind that if you're interested in this and you find it fun, there's all sorts of things you can do to learn more about it. So next year, if you're on the forensics and security degree, next semester you will be doing this in a lot more detail. Um, and uh, it is quite a, a um, exciting thing to, to be doing. Um, and uh, if you are not on the forensics and security degree, then um, in your final year, there is a module called um, digital security, and it's uh, similar where you'll also do um, ethical hacking in more detail. So in summary, uh, we've talked about ethical hackers, types of tests, penetration testing, and the various stages of attack. Uh, so thank you.